Future, episode 104, the fifth episode of the season, entitled The South Will Rise Again. Uh, my name's Adam Foxman, this is Mathis Coos, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit. We would love to field any questions, comments, and concerns. Uh, at this point, I can pretty much guarantee goddamn tea that your questions will be answered on air as we're in our first week of recording and not exactly swimming in feedback. Speaking of which, please rate us on iTunes. It is the number one way that you can support our show, and we would really, really appreciate it. How you doing, Mathis? What's going on? Eh, not a whole lot. Just uh, <laughs> ready to dive into this bitch. Uh, I, I like that it starts off with uh, the little cowboy guy again. I, I do too, because it's like, Jesus Christ, this is episode 5, right? Or 104. And Yeah, and all we got was that random glimpse, which felt so out of that, place before, and now we get a little bit more. And that was episode 2, so it's been two entire episodes without any kind of... So much of a mention. Now. Yeah. Um, but I, I really like this one immediately. It's, it doesn't say 1881, but it's the same year. It says, you know, rat water or rot water. And uh, Cowboy Buddy, as we call him, is now on the adventure trying to get the medicine for his family uh, and scro- you know, strolls into a new town. Exactly. So, uh, I, and I just love the music when he's riding too. It's yeah. so ominous and foreboding. It's just like these uh, shrieking strings and these blasting French horns, and yeah. uh, it's and, just very intense. And they supplement it with um, like really, really intense wind noise, but it's kind of quiet and almost seems like it's part of the music. Yeah, it's uh, it, it definitely lends to like a certain level of tension immediately in the scene. Mm-hmm. It's a, I, I loved it. I thought it was genius. But anyway, he strolls into town, heads into the uh, the apothecary, yeah, the asking point. for this medicine, and uh, it's not going to be ready till morning. So we know we're settling in for uh, for an evening in rot water. Now, uh, one quick thing as well that I thought, and I wanted to run it by you, but um, right before he gets in there, the pharmacist or, or whatever you, you would call him back then, apothecarian, uh, has the family go to the saloon which is supposed to have great ice cream and, and this that and the other which i think comes up next scene but maybe I, I was thinking these two characters look too similar um i don't know that i caught that oh so you're saying the the ones that we end up seeing in the back room i thought that was the same little boy as the scene before damn if would, that's yeah if that's the case that's kind of interesting it makes it seem like the whole town's kind of in on the brutality in which case well, we're getting ahead of ourselves, so what happens next? Okay, okay, yeah. All right, yeah, you, you're right there. That, that is interesting if that's the case. Um, so the, the cowboy ends up going over to the Inn and Saloon. I, mm-hmm. I think it said Coolies, uh, something like that. Yeah, something um, like that. There's no rooms. The dude basically just offers him, like, a, a stool over at one of the tables. So uh, With free whiskey. Also, yeah, exactly. Um, there is a guy selling scalps, um, uh, and he is kind of being told off a little bit for trying to pass off what the guy is, is saying or, as a yeah indian he's saying scalp. they're indian scalps and then the, the 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 innkeeper is not fooled at all and like he recognizes that these are mexican scalps and he tries just to leave them on the bar he's like uh-uh you take him out back yeah <laughs> yeah exactly uh i, I thought uh, thought that was kind of funny how could anybody tell the difference between like an indian's i like i just didn't quite get that that'd be pretty tough yeah, I don't. I'm, no comment. No comment. Okay. Never, I don't know how you talk to tell between before. scalp versus scalp. Period. Much less of, you know. Yeah, no, you're more of a phrenologist. I got gotcha. you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh-huh, That's my, uh-huh. my field. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, he does notice in the back room, and this is going back to what you talked about a minute ago. There's a man just going to town on this pioneer woman as her son is forced to watch and you see the husband lying in a pool of blood Mm -hmm. which might be as you said uh the same person that had been referred to go there by um the the man running the apothecary yeah the only person that i i could get a good shot of was the kid and it looked like the same kid because they show up a a close-up of the kid's face um when the you know pharmacist rubs his cheek and says they got real good ice cream over there Huh, yeah, I, I, I didn't notice that, but uh, you might be right. Um, uh, in the background of this scene, there's this preacher telling uh, some 
story about how Noah can't stop playing with his cock or something like that. He's, he's getting a pretty good laugh. It seemed like a pretty good story. Yeah, it sounds like he's preaching, but he's just telling a very dirty joke. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and so he seems to recognize uh, the cowboy guy. Um, yeah. But before he can really put two and two together, someone kind of pulls him off to go join back in the merriment. Yeah. Uh, they have that scene. Um, I think at this point, it essentially cuts to... Him picking up the medicine Him picking up the morning the next morning, which you know, the, the pharmacist had the best he could do was first thing in the morning. Uh, and then he, he rides out of the city, but halfway... I don't know about halfway, but you know, it shows him writing for a while, and then he has second thoughts. He he, he hears. Um, well, he ends up seeing the the family is what happens. So oh, that, uh, yeah. that's who was on the, the the horse and carriage. Exactly, and the little kid, you know, says hi to him again, and I guess that it just starts resonating with him. Uh, you know what happened to the other family, and that if he just stands uh, okay. by and doesn't do anything, uh, then this family is going to also suffer that terrible, terrible fate. So gotcha. he turns around, starts galloping back in, gets to uh, Rotwater. Uh, cowboy looks into their covered wagon. There's a dog lapping up blood inside. Mm-hmm. He strides full speed into the saloon. Uh, the preacher comes up to him, says he knows where he saw him. He, he backhands him, him to the yeah. ground, <laughs> yeah. strides into the back room, and finds the pioneer father alive and well selling scalps. And then... The cowboy gets his ass beat mercilessly by the preacher and uh, his merry gang of thugs. Yeah, and in the uh, the ruckus, you can see him reach for and, and salvage the medicine. Yes. And he basically gets away from the savage beating because they let him live. He stumbles out. He gets on his horse. And then that preacher comes out and says, Now I know I recognize you. Mm-hmm. Gettysburg. Um, yeah, and, and so he Third mentions, day. yeah, he mentions the regiments they're in. Essentially, says I've never seen anyone on the field who has loved killing as much as you. Yeah, um, men and horses. Yeah, and so he, he put a, a gun to the horse's head. Um, Guy says, "Don't." And then he shoots him. He hits the ground, and now he's forced to walk home to get this medicine to his family. And unfortunately, it's it's not quick enough. Yeah, he's trekking across the prairie by foot. Obviously, it takes infinitely longer than it would have by horse. And uh, when he returns home, the crows are feasting on the body of his dead daughter and wife. It is a very gross scene. Um, uh, Really uh, sad, too, obviously. And... He pauses for a minute in the doorway and then opens up the closet, grabs out his gun, saber, all that stuff from the closet. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's go time. Yeah, and, and it cuts off and leaves off there. So I imagine next time they give us a flashback, you're going to see some uh, wholesale slaughter. Yeah, I can't wait. Wholesale I mean, uh, slaughter. I couldn't say that right. No, wholesale. That was good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a uh, soothsayer. Yeah, exactly. So s- still at this point, we have zero tie into present other than that tree really is all that it is. The tree that's outside of town uh, that you actually see people in present day under in multiple scenes I've noticed now. And uh, yeah. in the past, there is all the bodies hanging from it. So all we know is that Rotwater is on the site that is now Anvil uh, just 130 years in the past. Yeah, and if, if I believe this is the scene where you get to see the gorgeous, gorgeous sunset as Preacher's just chilling out there. Um, let's see. I have Sheriff Root uh, as the next scene. Oh, okay. I'm skipping ahead then. Yeah, um, it, it's Sheriff Root. He's looking for intruders in the yard after he noticed a noise. Um, uh, sees a saw that's clattering in the wind. He's, he's out there just... Uh, it feels like he's going to find something there's nothing he goes back inside he tells eugene to go to bed Mm -hmm. uh he sits down and then eugene calls him upstairs and there's a message on the wall painted uh finish the job and uh under the finish the job is a shotgun propped on the wall with an arrow pointed to it and uh sheriff root at this point asks um did you go back to her house? Her being, and do you remember her name? He, the, yeah, no, he actually says Tracy's. Tracy, so the, the girl that's been in the coma that has the wound in the top of her head, which you're not sure about, but now that you've seen um, Eugene be called a murderer at church, so you were definitely right on that one, and you know now they're kind of piecing things together. 
uh, it's looking like he definitely had something to do with it. Exactly. Uh, Tracy, and uh, I think that her last name is Loach, is what I have. Yeah, the Loach down. is. I knew the last name was Loach, but I didn't know. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, um, uh, we're getting a little bit more here showing that Eugene obviously did do something that negatively impacted this family, most likely put her in this uh, uh, coma state that she was in before. So. Anyway, um, next scene is exactly what you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I was a little yes. scrolled down there, but it's just... It's Gorgeous ob- cinematography. Yeah, it's obviously CGI. Like, it's very, yes. very yeah, oh yeah, it's bright, way too poppy colors, but it's just a gorgeous sunset with this tree, which most of what we see in the show is kind of bleak, um, muted color palette, so it, it definitely stands out. Oh, yeah, so he's just sitting there smiling to himself, and uh, um, also, I don't know if you noticed, but one of those pipes... Uh, that we think might be linked to possibly the Kin Cannon uh, mm-hmm. uh, Industries or whatever. Um, one of those pipes is next to the tree, too. Yeah, and maybe this is the scene I was thinking about last podcast when I was talking about in the episode you're starting to almost see these pipes surround the area that the preacher inhabits. Yes, exactly. Uh, this this I don't think in the last one that you saw too many of them, but definitely uh, this one stuck out to me because it's this kind of interesting uh juxtaposition between the beautiful scenery in the background and then this like Mm -hmm. kind of uh weathered pipe coming up out of the ground um but anyway uh so then jesse is uh sitting at the flavor station that diner uh with the preacher lady emily i'm sorry not preacher lady the church lady emily sitting across Mm -hmm. from him just asked him like what the hell happened with kin cannon at the sunday service um she just doesn't it's just none of it's sitting quite right with her i mean i guess she's happy with the result of it but she feels like something is awry yeah it's it's very much like we discussed um she doesn't really approve of the preacher's methods but eventually of what he's trying to get to and so she's always questioning him um but before it gets too tense and awkward you have teens over there who want to settle a lame bed about which is the best gospel yeah, <laughs> and then it starts in on what is basically an ep- episode-long mission of uh, the preacher to basically sit at a booth at the diner and fix the problems of all the uh, the peons around town. Yeah, so there's this ongoing uh, motif, like scene in, scene out, of him hearing the, the town's problems and, and diner seats and yeah, often, he fixes often some using guys his powers to fix them. with a mother-in-law and just yeah basically that's it like that's kind of obviously it seems like uh, one of the little hubs of the town where people cycle in and out of mm-hmm. uh, and he seems to be attracting a little bit of a, a following here he also seems to like it kind of on like a selfish level it very seems much. like like he's very very pleased with himself throughout this <laughs> whole episode and i wonder if you know it doesn't seem like he understands that he had that one dude cut his heart out like i don't think he ever put those two together yeah it, it does right? not seem if if he did realize then he uh he's pretty cold because yeah. he does not seem to give a shit but i'm wondering if they'll use any of these that right now are kind of thrown aside as like real basic miracles i wonder if any of these will kind of have a tainted or evil consequence after the fact that maybe we find about in later episodes uh well he'd basically be taking out like 70 percent of the town at this point it feels like because uh it seems like in this episode it's just one after the other you know line up get you know get your miracle uh look at your um you know the saint mary on burned onto the the uh, what is it the the cheese bread what is that thing that the virgin mary was on like a i thought it was jesus grilled on cheese toast. sandwich is that what it was it was jesus on a grilled cheese sandwich yeah that sounds right yeah okay so yeah they're just all basically all there kind of for their miracle although mm-hmm. i will say it doesn't necessarily seem like it's reached that level of fervor where they think no. it's truly a miracle they just uh, they're all sort of experiencing a reawakening. Exactly. They, yeah, they trust and, him. Uh, and I'm not necessarily saying that the adverse effects would be killing everyone, but even just something as simple as I, th- I believe one of the things he says in the episode is um, use your best judgment. And like, if someone just has terrible judgment, then that still could end up awry. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, so it, it might just be comedic, like missteps and, you know, broke relationships, not necessarily 
hearts on the table and blood and yeah. all that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are different levels uh, to that. Yeah. So, okay, all right, that's a good point. Um, uh, moving to the next scene is Cassidy waking up uh, at Tulips. Uh, he is basically fully, uh, fully healed now, and mm-hmm. she just starts interrogating him about being a vampire. Just, you know, do crosses have any effect on you? Do you have fangs? Uh, does the sunlight mess you up? Um, and it, I thought that was kind of cool because you get a little bit of insight into the lore about vampirism in the world. Yeah, and essentially, I think all the mainstay stuff doesn't work, right? Not garlic, not that type of thing, but... Only the sunlight. Only the sunlight. And, you know, as we've seen, it's got to be, you know, direct sunlight. And I think he... I don't know if he explains it or maybe we just discussed it. It's obviously it just burst into flames immediately. Yeah, he doesn't necessarily explain. Well, if he did, I didn't have the closed captioning on, so I probably caught 40% <laughs> yeah. of what he was saying. Um, I did catch the part where he said he drinks the blood to heal, but he doesn't necessarily crave, crave it. it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that, that was pretty interesting, too. But uh, basically, uh, you know, he ends up following her downstairs, asks her for suggestions on how to get drugs. Uh, which seems to be a pretty common theme with him is the mm-hmm. constantly chasing that dragon. Um, yeah, he craves something, and just blood isn't part of it. Exactly. Um, so then he basically tells her he's in love with her. Uh, she ends up rejecting him, saying that she's waiting for her boyfriend to ditch his job so they can go kill this man who screwed them, <laughs> talking about Carlos. And, and I'm, uh, I'm so over her talking about Carlos in this crusade. Oh, my God. Point. Yeah, she, she ends up tell, you know, telling him that Carlos took everything from them. We've heard this sob story. Uh, yeah. took two years to find out where he is. Uh, her, her boyfriend said no to going and finding him. Um, and uh, you, Ca- and you just feel like, okay, you're explaining all this to Cassidy, but you've heard it all. Oh, yeah, I mean, God, us as the audience, we've heard it ad nauseum. Um, it, and I, I will say, the only character I really have a main qualm with is her, and I think otherwise she's a really good actress, and she has a lot to offer, and they they kicked her off as a badass, but they spent so much of these episodes with her just saying the same story, and, and not, you know, kind of being like almost helpless to it. Yeah, it's a shame, because she probably would be my second favorite character behind Cassidy at this point. If it wasn't just for the the single mindedness uh, of wanting him to, and honestly, it would be fine if he just go and fucking do it already, and they could <laughs> yeah, just, spend a couple go, episodes killing Carlos and then yeah, get back. Exactly, to it. kill Carlos over the weekend and then get back to uh, saving your city. Maybe they could do it in between episodes. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, just be like, <laughs> I don't know, between preacher instead of saying like previously <laughs> yeah. on yeah, exactly. and all that. Be like between episodes of preacher. Carlos has been killed. Yeah, this on. occurred last Thursday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, Cassidy says uh, something to the effect of, uh, maybe this boyfriend isn't the... Ma- <laughs> okay, <I'm not> gonna <laughs> even you and accents are accent. my favorite new thing. All right. All right. Uh, yeah. You just sound like the Lucky Charms guy. <laughs> it, uh, maybe, All right. <laughs> maybe this man you're into isn't what you expected, hey? <laughs> that was a lot better than mine, actually. <laughs> Ooh, okay, so he says something in his Irish accent, which I will never, ever again try to do, that uh, maybe this boyfriend isn't the man she thought he was. Yeah. And uh, and basically, Cassidy has no idea that she's actually talking about his little buddy, Jesse. Yeah, so that you know, as the audience, there's a little insight there. I do think they overplayed the exposition, but o- otherwise it, it can be kind of affecting. One thing I'm going to bring up, maybe you don't remember it, Maybe I'm crazy, but her uncle, or who she says is her uncle, is a black dude with like super white hair, right? Yes, definitely. On the, He's on the asleep couch. on the couch. He's always asleep. Um, have we seen him in other episodes? Yeah, sleeping. We saw him when a uh, preacher comes into the house in one episode early on okay. and uh, realizes that Tulip is in town or something, I think. And I'm actually checking this right now, but I'm pretty sure he is asleep uh, in that opening scene of last episode, before the girls running and paint, like being attacked in paintballs, I think he's just sleeping against a wall in an alleyway next to the mascot. Yes, he absolutely is. Yeah, one hundred percent right. I remember that. Now. Not crazy about that. So he's just kind of this ongoing funny joke, and apparently it's Tulip's uncle. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so I, I, at some point, I read his name, but I don't think that that is 
actually been shown to us at any point. Oh, Walter. I, I wrote it down. His okay. name is Walter, but I don't think that that impacts anything one way or the other. Okay. It, anyway, after um, all this, that, and the other, like Cassie explains he's super into her, but she isn't having it because of you know her being so hard on for Jesse. Um, and so you know, I, I just like that Cassie ends it by slamming Jesse, not realizing that they're connected at all. Yeah, exactly. You know? Um, uh, so the next scene is, uh, Donnie, he, he, we don't have to go too into it cause not a whole lot happens, but he's just moping around in bed, pretend, you know, doesn't want to go to work. He says he's feeling sick. Comparing um, himself to the animals that are, are set for slaughter that don't know any better. Exactly. <laughs> and she's just like, you know what? Get out of the fucking bed. Quit being a pussy. I'm going to screw Russell from accounting yeah. who, who gives me that look every week. Exactly. And actually, this is where the title uh, of the episode comes because she says something to the effect of, you know, you've been in a lot of bar fights and everyone loses one eventually and uh, the South will rise again. Yeah, she makes the uh, reference to his Civil War reenactment and then, you know, essentially just being not so closet racist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, there, there's not much else to that scene, so we, we could probably just... Uh, move just it along, move, move it along. Nothing to e- see here. Exactly. Even the next one was honestly just a, a quick little filler scene with Fiore and DeBlanc there. Phones uh, ring in the motel room still, and, and they're, they're rehearsing in no what to rush say. To, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're not, like, not in any hurry to get this going. They're, they're sitting there rehearsing in the bathroom about telling their bosses about the massive security breach, and Is it, they're just yeah. running lines, basically, and that's it. They don't answer the phone, the phone doesn't stop, they just, that's it, we're on to the next scene. Yeah, and this scene, also not the most impactful, but it's Emily straightening up stuff around her house, and moving stuff around, then she goes to pee, and she hears footsteps in the house, uh, and it's Tulip there to threaten her for being too close to Jesse. Exactly, and uh, it, the way she looked her up and down when uh, when she before she talked to her was super creepy and intimidating. Yeah, it definitely was. I would not want to be victim to that in the toilet. Let me ask you, if you were her in that scene, would you have stopped midstream like she did? Um, if I could, but sometimes there's just so much force. Now, see, I, I got the shy bladder syndrome. There's no chance. If I heard <laughs> any sound like that, it, it would be game over for a lifetime. Yeah, I don't know. I might make a, a like race to the finish line just so I could get up and be mobile and escape. <laughs> you really? So you don't think that you could cut it off halfway and make your escape like two seconds faster? You'd actually have to push your way through it. Maybe it might be like my dog. Whenever he's taking too long, and I kind of say, "Come on," and he just keeps peeing as he walks. Oh uh, yeah. See, when my dogs do that, the you know what? <laughs> How about we just? <laughs> I, I just realized that 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 story was getting away from us. So let's end that tangent there. Fair enough. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so, uh, so anyway, um, I think Emily ends up telling him that he's at the, the flavor station, that diner. So, um, so anyway, she, she, she fucks off at that point and Eugene, uh, is cooking breakfast for the sheriff route at the, and this was a really heartbreaking scene. For yeah. Me. I mean, he's making these, uh, delightful fluffy omelets. Um, sheriff almost quite seems fluffy, like he fluffy. has a hangover. He's just like holding his pulsing forehead and uh eugene serves him breakfast um you know says i love you i think and and sheriff roots just like non-respondent and then offers to cut his food to which he seems like why would you cut my food like i don't know just to help and so he starts to and it starts to um you know create kind of like the screeching fingernails on a chalkboard terrible scraping sound yeah Yeah. so they they do a good job building the intensity there because you already feel like he's about to bust uh, and then he yeah, says you can just terrible. see the veins popping. Yeah, and then he he says the terrible thing of um, he slams the omelet that played against the wall, it shatters, and says, "You should do what they tell you and just finish the job." Yeah, I love the way that he delivered it too. Was just really intense and really heartbreaking. He says, uh, "If you really want to help, maybe you should do like they said and go ahead and finish the goddamn job." And Eugene yeah. just looks like totally taken aback, super sad. Sheriff looks like he's like instantly regrets it, but he's Doesn't not say going anything to about say it. anything. Yeah. And Eugene just like kind of 
uh, slinks over to the other side of the table and quietly starts picking up the pieces. Yeah, it's kind of heartbreaking, and I will say, I had this written down, I think, even later, but he's a pretty good actor, just ma- mainly with his eyes, because like, the, the lower half of his face doesn't move because of the prosthetics. Yeah, I, I agree. I, like, I, I honest, honest to God, I felt super sad in this moment. No, to be fair, we don't know what he did. Like, because if he really put that girl in the coma and she was like totally innocent, and or even if she wasn't, I mean, he could be. He could have a past of like being a bit of a monster, and we're just catching him in like his atonement state. So maybe, maybe he's not like this super innocent guy that we should be uh, feeling so sorry for, but. I mean, I'll be damned if I would, didn't tear up a little bit at that scene where Pops was giving it to him so badly. Yeah, it affected me, but I didn't, I didn't tear up because I'm not a pussy. <laughs> You're a fucking asshole. <laughs> You're the worst. I am the worst. All right, so um, so anyway, <laughs> moving on. Uh, the next scene was very short, but actually I thought it was kind of interesting. I wanted to see what you thought about it. It's uh, some mysterious control room. There's a dude tapping on some gauge. It releases the pressure. Uh, so that the needle starts lowering, and then he leaves the room, and uh, since the next scene goes straight to Kin Cannon, it immediately makes you wonder if it has something to do with the pipes that are coming up from the ground around Anvil. Yeah, I mean, that's that was my guess from it. My guess was that there's some kind of probably, like, gas problem uh, in the city because yeah, of the like things that... Yeah, like maybe a leak of some kind or I, yeah, I don't know, I mean, something like that. Something between the power and the meat that, that Kin Cannon provides. Like, you know, having tons and tons of, like, animals in close quarters has methane problems. There's all kinds of gas problems with, like, different farming. So I think it's supposed to imply that this guy is in the control room keeping things maintainable uh, outside of, you know, so there's not a widespread scandal and people don't realize what's actually happening. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, it, it's something along those. Either way, I think it's just trying to clue us in a little bit that um, that that things are under control with Kin Cannons right now, but that they're not far away from boiling like, kettle. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. So that that was pretty much it. Uh, but so the next scene with Kin Cannon is uh, him w- meeting with Miles, the mayor, in his office, and. Uh, Admits to being strike a deal. Exactly. Yeah, he's you know he's feeling a little bit you know a little bit bad about how they ended off last time, uh, and basically Miles is surprised to to hear you know all of this and kind of uh, connects it back to King Cannon uh, at Sunday service and so yeah, serving God. Yeah, exactly. And um, well, Donnie is shocked to hear that King Cannon attended church and. He starts to basically have some internal freak out, uh, and then just gets up and starts basically frantically asking, and gets to the point of like, uh, I mean, total meltdown. Um, yeah, you know, what did Jesse say to you? What did he say? Yeah, he's a very good um, eye actor as well, because you think about the scene when he yeah, has he the is. gun in his mouth, totally, and he just looks frantic, and then he's just like, "Motherfucker, wait, you went to church?" And obviously, he knows his boss doesn't go to church, and then. He went to the preacher's church, and yeah, he just starts screaming, what did he say, what did he say, knowing that he took control of him by his words. And then Ken Cannon says, well, he, you know, he, he told me to, to serve God, Donnie, yeah. and it, it's your will till this day on. Something like that. And um, he goes, oh, sorry, and, and sits down, but he's, you know, obviously freaking the fuck out inside. Well, yeah, and, and Ken Cannon asks if uh, if it's okay. Yell else. Yeah, and, like are you gonna yell <laughs> anything else at me while I'm sitting here with the mayor? And uh, but yeah, so Donnie's mind, you can tell, is just racing. And uh, Ken Cannon tells Miles, "Go ahead and set up the meeting with the Green Acres executives." Yeah, but it's clear in this scene, Miles and Donnie don't recognize this man. Yeah, exactly. Like he is completely he's way too nice and and he just, he cares about people. And, Definitely. He's out of his element, Donnie. Yeah. Um no, you're you not going to get the a... the uh, Big Lebowski reference. No. You're out of your Sorry. element, Donnie. You know Walter's always shouting that at uh <clears throat> at uh Steve Buscemi's character. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh-huh. A swing and a miss. You could have given me the want 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 want. That's pretty good. 
Oh, okay. I thought it sounded like a dead cat. (laughs) Um, (laughs) All right, so the next scene is them at the flavor station again, and uh, Jesse... Changing lives. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, So basically, uh, you know, he's telling the dude about, you know, ways to fix thing with his mother-in-law, uses that word of God thing on him, and then Tulip interrupts and uh, tells a story about a a bad man, uh, a story about... Um, I, I, her boyfriend that she was with or something like that that goes and they met some Rasta man who was flirting with her and then uh, that bad boy shot a Komodo dragon right in the head just to fuck with the guy and uh, basically looking and saying like that bad man is Jesse and he is totally unfazed and says and look at me now really look and be honest I have changed you see that right which means you can change too we don't have to be what we've been. You can be good. We all want to be good. And uh, Yeah. They have an interesting exchange. They do a few things uh, that I kind of find are cop-outs, but also find are, are interesting. And one of which is, you know, she basically has him shooting an innocent animal um, in front of this guy. And I think the words he says is, look, if you don't, if she didn't want me looking, she shouldn't put that booty on in the morning, which I, I thought was a pretty funny line. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that was pretty good. Yeah, he uh, he does not seem particularly affected by anything that happened in his past. I mean, honestly, maybe he yeah. does know what happened to the uh, the mommy guy um, and just doesn't really give a shit. Like, he definitely has some sociopathic tendencies. He does. He does, however, make sure to explain to the uh, the audience that... Uh, the Komodo dragon, they were going to eat him. She's like, yeah, they, you don't they know that. Spit ready anyway. like, they had a barbecue spit ready. So um, they try to kind of, de- I mean, I think that's equally for the audience as it is for the people around him because he doesn't seem to give a shit to say like, hey, this animal's dying anyway. I just had to, you know. Yeah, that's true. I'll make it seem like he's woman. not quite as much of a monster. As crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, that was, that was pretty much it for that scene. Uh, waitress comes up and tells Jesse that someone's waiting for him outside and it turns out it's uh, it's Eugene R's face. Um, yeah, the the waitress says, uh, "I ain't letting him in here." Yeah, don't let or, that or thing in here. in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah something like that. <laughs> um, and so Eugene's just kind of lamenting that everyone hates him and that it's all his fault. And uh, preacher says he doesn't hate him, but uh, Eugene says that after Tracy Loach, not even God wants to help him. Um, and then basically asks preacher if he'd help his father, who obviously we've seen is in some serious anguish at this point. Yeah, and so um, Preacher says, you know, with his eyes says yes. He didn't actually say yes. And next thing you know, they're on their way to the loaches. Preacher asks to come in. She's super excited to see him because the last, you know, the last time he was there, her eyes opened. And, yeah, miracle, uh, man. Right? And then she freaks the fuck out because she notices Eugene in the car. She takes a bat, starts smashing it up. Preacher runs out, uses his power to say, drop it. She drops it, then finds a, like, you know, a bush shears and immediately starts smashing the car. Uh, it's a, a pretty intense scene. It is. I mean, it almost seems like her anger is such that she's actually almost trying to fight it at first, the whole word of God thing. Uh, she's still yeah. yelling, murderer, I'll kill you, um, and things like that. And basically he has to tell her, like, step away from the car, uh, then gets Eugene to come out of the car, and he tells her, like, this boy has made a terrible mistake. You're both suffering. Forgive him. And then uh, he uses the word of God or whatever, and Mrs. Loach gives a, uh, a hug to a very hesitant Eugene. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this is, is where his eyes are just darting all over because he's like, "What the fuck is happening?" See now on on one end of the spectrum, yes, like uh, getting closure and healing things is fine, but also like the fact that he's forcing these sort of things on to people. It's also it's, really kind of fucked up. I mean, it's basically like like a mental, emotional, and kind of physical rape in a little bit of a way. Like he's literally very using much so. them like like puppets. I mean, he's he has better intentions than uh, K- Kilgrave from Jessica Jones, but he's using it just about as carelessly as Kilgrave did. Yeah, and it's. Um... I don't know, it's interesting, too, because as someone who grew up going to Bible school, one of the big things about the, the Bible is God gives you free will. So if this is indeed the power of God or something related to it, he's violating that and making people believe in God, making people forgive, um, instead of you know what his overall message is, that that should happen you know, through the light of God. So I think it's going to this head, and he's thinking he is that light, 
and there's no difference between him commanding it and it you know happening naturally because he's well, nature and maybe that's part of the reason that he was chosen for it because this thing that's within him is the spawn of a demon and an angel so it's you know part good and part evil and honestly that's kind of what he is like he has good intentions but he does horrible horrible things often misguided uh doesn't seem to feel like any true or deep remorse for the things that he's done even necessarily um, but wants to do better moving forward so i mean I, he is almost like this physical manifestation uh and perfect host for exactly what that spirit thing is yeah yeah absolutely so you're you're not sure why it chose him but you're maybe starting to see um through his actions and his the way he uses it that maybe there's a correlation exactly so um uh, that's about it for that scene uh next uh, you have poor donnie uh, and betsy they're eating their lunch outside of king can and meat and power um and donnie starts telling her uh, a little bit about how preacher has the power to force people to do things he mentions chester the molester whose name mm -hmm. is linus um and uh he mentions kin cannons acting odd too after meeting with the preacher and uh then he tells her about uh, preacher forcing him to put the gun in his mouth and he starts crying and uh you know when you were telling uh, a few minutes ago when you were talking about how he is also really good at uh emoting with his eyes uh, mm -hmm. I, I really felt it during this scene. I mean, like, yeah, yeah he, he is really good at it. And again, with the scene with the gun in his mouth, uh, the, yeah, that actor really, especially since uh, it seems in the very beginning like he's just playing some, you know, dumb as bricks, meathead, jock, sort of, yeah. you know, uh, just bully. Uh, they don't give you much emotional compl complexity early on. Exactly, but now he's like, he's basically just got this, like, uh, terrible... Uh, affliction basically that the preachers brought up within him about you know he's used to being the tough guy and now like preacher basically literally had his way with him and now he's you know he's already in this weird sexual relationship where he beats his wife and yet now he's crying to her saying please don't don't screw russell in the county yeah. <laughs> like pleading with her yeah which, um you i mean to he, her he credit she says that she won't yeah, I mean, she just said it won't, but it's weird because you do feel for him, but you also kind of still think he's a piece of shit, and they, they do a good job of that throughout the show, kind of having you um, feel and, and think about different perspectives for different characters, because they don't really present anyone as a blanket um, character that's good or evil. They, they, everyone has some complexities in gray areas. Well, yeah, I mean, you're rooting for Preacher the entire time, uh, yeah. mainly because he's the main character, but any time they start showing these other characters and the the effects that his bulldozer ways are having on the people around him uh you start to realize that uh again you know he has the he has good intentions for these things um but he is just as flawed as every single one of these other people he just has a power that uh that he's abusing essentially at this point Indeed. Um, but Betsy uh, tells him that Preacher's going to get what he deserves at some point. Yeah, it ends on an ominous note. Exactly. Maybe she'll get involved. Yeah. Um, and then there were a couple other little scenes here that didn't really have too much to them, but uh, just in case they end up becoming significant later on. Um, Tulip, this is the first scene we've seen her since Jesse says everybody wants to strive to be good. Um, and this scene is her putting on a ski mask and robbing a drugstore. Uh, I did drugstore write down a note about the mask that she was wearing. It did not particularly cover her face up very well. And, uh, and, and I will, and she's very unique looking, you know, she's striking. And especially this is a very small town. Um, and she is a, a, some sort of mixed ethnicity or something like that. I feel like th since the mask only covered like maybe 60% of her face, like I would definitely yeah. know that it was her, especially because it's not like she's wearing like big baggy clothes. Like she's wearing tight fitting clothes. I don't know. I, yeah. just thought, like, I, I think you have to just, uh, yeah, suspend your your disbelief because I think the actress is like Ethiopian and Irish apparently, so she's very unique in Texas anyway. Um, and it's a TV show; they wanted to look kind of like 
sexy and cool robbing a bank yeah i guess you're right um uh, i'm just saying like they could have had her put on like a dead president's mask or something and yeah that would have solved it for me maybe it was actually a bank but ultimately she was just stealing these drugs for cassidy yeah yeah that's that's true um uh, and to which she presents them with them and uh a kind of surprising yet makes sense scene happen yeah it, exactly uh they they basically end up screwing in the back of the car she does not look like she's into it she's like looking uh, i don't know depressed out of the window uh while it's happening that was that I, was I, kind of a sad scene that reminded me of like requiem for a dream a little bit ass to ass <laughs> <laughs> yeah something like that but my, my note said uh she's super into it but I'm pretty sure I was being sarcastic then. Yeah, I'm assuming so. You know, you're supposed to put like a like a backslash s when you're writing sarcasm, so that people know that that's what you're doing. Oh, I didn't know that. I, how do you even do a backwards s? A ba- no, a backslash and then an s. Oh, that's easier. Yeah, <laughs> backwards s. Um, no, there used I'm to be all these. Go with there impossible. used to be all these weird like you know keyboard shortcuts to do alternate characters, but you know. That's for a different podcast. <laughs> I, I would definitely not listen to that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Alternate thoughts of your keyboard throughout time. Exactly. Now let's move on from it before people stop listening to ours. <laughs> um, there was a, a quick little scene in, actually in between there where Fiore and DeBlanc uh, kind of were rehearsing the lines one more time. So, uh-huh. uh, DeBlanc says, Fiore, you, you've got to be the one to do it. Like They really like you out there. Like You're a nice guy and stuff like that. And uh, he finally goes to answer the phone, and it stops ringing. They look at each other like, oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Yeah, not good. (laughs) Whoever was trying to get a hold of us is now officially on their way here. Exactly. So um, the last scene kind of... Actually, no, I guess this isn't the last scene. The penultimate scene ends off with uh, Sheriff Root bringing Fiore and DeBlanc to Jesse at the flavor station. Um, He basically shoes I don't off know who the, the fuck you are. yeah he shoes off the people that were sitting in the booth because again he's been there all day long meddling yeah. in everybody's lives <laughs> and uh <laughs> basically they kind of uh they start off by mentioning uh that they gave him the money and the drugs and now it's time for him to hold up his end of the bargain he's like completely what? perplexed what's going yeah. on and then they but, mention his skinny his skinny friend brokered the deals and then he realizes like yeah, that, that that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, he starts to realize that uh, these are the two angels that J- uh, Cassie's been telling him about, but that obviously Cassie's found a way to be a, a beneficial um, liaison between the two. Exactly. Um, and, and then they're explaining to him that they're from heaven and that they need what's inside of Jesse. And, uh, and that you've used way overused the powers. Yes, exactly. And then they, you know, set the tin can on the table and Jesse kind of laughs at the idea of God fitting inside of a, uh, I can't remember what the type of coffee is, but basically the, t- the coffee tin that they have. And yeah. uh, DeBlanc says, uh, I'm not doing the accent. God, I keep wanting to do the accent. but Just like, try I, it. It doesn't hurt anyone. What's inside of you, it isn't God, DeBlanc says. <laughs> that was, I mean, I feel like that was like a 6 out of 10. That, that wasn't bad, but it's still funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so uh, that line actually uh, comes back again later, the what's inside of you, it isn't God. Uh, but that's it for this scene, basically. Um, and then so you've got your final scene here, which I was uh, so good. Honestly, it really so ends good. the episode on such a great note. Um, yeah. Kin Cannon, uh, totally changed man, super you know mild mannered, polite. Uh, he meets with the Green Acre executives. They come into his office. He's uh, very humble and apologetic. Oh he's, yeah, he's... should have done this a long time ago. You know, I Just... was. Uh, you know, I was just uh, very stubborn, stuck in my ways. Uh, but now, you know, the, have a drink. Uh, so yeah, he has a great line. Like, it's past six, so you can't refuse brandy. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so, they, you know, he basically uh, he gets his drink. He says, should we wait for the other guy? Uh, and he basically decides not to. And he says, okay, let's begin. He reaches <laughs> behind the couch. It's an enormous, uh, what I'm assuming, shotgun or something like that. Yeah, it's a shotgun. And, faux show. Yeah, and he just blasts a hole into the middle of all three of these executives uh doesn't shoot miles uh thank god and then he ends up uh mowing down the last guy who walks into and miles is sorry i'm late yeah exactly (laughs) he gets shot (laughs) poor little fool uh Uh, and miles is just like looking on in total confusion and horror yeah so um 
this kind of gets to the the point I made earlier of I wonder how all these different commands using um, the word of not God apparently uh, what their repercussions are going to be because at this point Ken Cannon apparently like wholesale believes in God that's a change now because Jesse made it yet at the end of the day he wouldn't have met with Miles whatsoever much less would have murdered these people you know I mean it, no doubt about it the uh, the actions that Jesse took directly influenced uh, what happened here. Now, I because still Miles let up his guard. You know? But do we? I, I don't understand how him shooting them fits in with this new mantra that he has uh, adopted. Um, I don't one hundred percent know either. I imagine We're not supposed he's, to know, right? I imagine they're going to use it into as a commentary on you know people will justify anything by reading a religious book you know one way or another true or maybe we'll find out like that this green acres thing isn't all that it's cracked up to be and maybe these aren't like maybe the people that run it aren't christians or something maybe they're like some other religion uh, and aren't and you know what i mean like maybe they're not godly people somehow yeah, I mean, who, who knows? Or, or maybe it's just it's a threat in his mind to his community, and you're supposed to protect your community. I mean, there's any number of ways uh, where you know he can still be loyal to that truth that Jesse put in him, and still you know be someone shooting up people with a shotgun. Yeah. So that's how we end the episode off uh, on a very high and dark note, and. Um, it was it was an exciting uh, ending to the episode. I, I will say that yeah. uh, this episode, a little bit more than the others, uh, I kind of lagged a little bit. I mean, it's, it started off awesome with the, the cowboy stuff, I felt like. The rest of it was a, a little bit more of just building up the story um, all the way up until the end. And then I, I thought that that was a, you know, a great scene. But what do you think? Th- this was probably my... I liked it. I really did, but it was probably my least favorite of the episodes we'd seen up to this point. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'd go that far, but I'm trying to remember with each one. But um, I think the nice thing about the show is so far there aren't any episodes that I just am over. I think the downsides of this episode are the same. Some of the same downsides they've had in the past, which is over using like not developing Tulip and focusing too much on this one angle she has, which we already get completely um you're right i loved this end scene i love the 1881 scene where you get a little more of a uh, of cowboy buddy until we get a real name out of him. yeah although we still um, have zero tie-in to the present other than this happened on the past site exactly yeah exactly um you know and then the other kind of really important thing happening here is uh cassidy and tulip finally meeting so you're probably going to get pretty close soon here to all three main characters actually interacting and mingling and then the angels uh being in trouble like these are all the important things that happen uh otherwise though it's just a lot of little plot pieces that that move things along so i liked it but you know it's, it's probably a seven yeah um for me it was probably like a five and a half or a six um again you know i liked it but uh, if if this were to go five seasons and I was looking back on different episodes, this one would be wholly forgettable, uh, probably with the exception of the Ken Cannon thing at the end. But, mm-hmm. yeah, but you know, again, it, it was a good episode. It moved things along. I wasn't checking my phone or anything while it was going, so it's not like I was bored. But just in looking back at these other episodes and especially uh, listening back to some of the podcasts just to kind of check back so... I'm pretty refreshed on what's happened in the individual episodes uh, sure. leading into recording this one. Um, that just to me, it didn't grab me quite as much as the other ones. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, um, either way, I think we're both still very on board with the show. Oh, no, absolutely. No episodes ever like derailed anything, so I'm really excited to see where it goes from here. I think the most interesting bits are what are they going to reveal more about this heaven and hell thing and you know who's coming for the angels and then also um you know where quinn cannon's gonna go and then you know what's 
what kind of troubles trouble is Jesse going to get himself into by you know abusing these powers? Exactly, and at the same time, uh, hopefully, we'll get a little bit more concrete uh, facts and things like that. A, a glimpse into the past with Jesse's flashbacks, because right now the flashbacks are um, are just so loose that you're not really getting enough out of them for them to be particularly intriguing. Um, sure. And the uh, hopefully the uh, honestly I just like the the character and the scenes and the music and the cinematography and everything from the cowboy and Rotwater. Um, that uh, I mean I'm excited for them to start t- uh, putting that into because I know what that character ends up becoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm excited to see that develop. But honestly, just enjoying the ride of of every scene that they're because they're doing that old country western gritty sort of feel very well. Yeah, they're doing a really good job with it. Um, I'm curious how long they're going to make the origin. And if it's you know, fairly long, then I, I think one of the things they could have done throughout is give us a little bit each episode. But who knows? I mean, maybe they're just going to give us another 15 minutes and the rest of the season, and that'll be it. I feel like we're going to have most of the origin done throughout this season. That's That's what it feels like to me. And then by the end, we're going to be able to kind of... Um, bridge the gap. Ho- hopefully so. I-, I am looking forward to that moment, whether it's the cliffhanger of this season or or something pretty early on next season. Yeah, exactly. But um, okay. Well, uh, that pretty much does it. Uh, again, this was episode one hundred and four, the fifth episode. The South will rise again. Um, I'm Adam Foxman. This is Mathis Coos. Uh, again, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit. Uh, we'd love to field your questions, so uh, please feel free to write us in on any of those platforms. Uh, at this point, we can definitely guarantee that we're going to answer any of your questions on air. So um, uh, please rate us on iTunes. Uh, it is the number one way that you can support our show, and uh, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys again for listening. Uh, we're really enjoying doing this, and we should have the next episode up in a few days.